Okay. A lot is going on in this week's tour portion. Short of any uh, great amazement and action, there is a lot, a lot going on and a lot of interesting things. So I just want to give a little bit of a recap of, of what transpired last week, because if you did read last week's Torah portion, you're kind of left on a cliffhanger. I guess whoever wrote the Torah and split up the Torah portions was a really, really good author. Well, obviously it was God, but all jokes aside, the story that we started last week with Joseph, um, you know, interrogating his brothers really was a tremendous shift in, in the plot of what is going on, what is taking place in our Torah. So last week we see Joseph going, like the very famous saying, from rags to riches. He went from being a slave and a prisoner to being freed and being the viceroy, the second most powerful human being on the planet during that time. Second to Paro, who was the most powerful human being at that time, being that Egypt was the America of today, of equivalent back then. Now, last week we had the seven good years of plenty, where Joseph had his very strategic method in, in gathering food and preparing for the sustenance, sustainability of the, the world, I guess the middle, middle Eastern part of the world. Now, uh, as that continues, uh, Joseph realizes that there will come a time that his brothers will be sent and, and join him in Egypt. And it came, Jacob sends after, uh, unfortunately, them also being struck by this great, great famine and plague. They also um, were decided to come down to Egypt. Jacob sends his 10 sons to go and buy food. Joseph notices them right away. And he right away separates Shimon from the rest of them. As we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, he wanted to make their Shimon and Levi were separate because the two of them together um, had the power to take down any strength, uh, any monarchy. So he split the two together. Uh, from, from, from one another, and he, he threw Shimon in jail, and he separated him from, from the rest of his brothers. In the meantime, he interrogates his brothers, of course his brothers not knowing who he is, and they say, oh, we have a younger brother. You have a younger brother? Amazing. Go get him. They go home, a whole to-do. Yaakov didn't want to send him. The famine gets even stronger, and Yaakov agrees to send him after Judah promises that he will uh, make sure Benjamin is safe and bring him back to his father. They come back and Joseph still doesn't know what he's going to do with them. And he ends up letting them go, but he frames his brother Benjamin by putting his own silver goblet in his sack um, of grain. They come back to make a long story short, which we'll get more into in, in, a little later in tonight's class. But Joseph wants Benjamin to be his slave. And the brothers go nuts, absolutely berserk. Out of anybody and everybody, is this the one that we're going to have issues with? To the point where Judah, and this is the beginning of this week's Torah portion, confronts Joseph and offers himself instead as a slave to Joseph forevermore instead of, instead of Benjamin. I want you to take a look at the beginning of chapter 45. And I believe this says a lot about what's going on. So Joseph is approached by Judah and tells him, I will be a slave for you instead of this boy. And now Joseph says as follows, This is chapter 45, verse 1. Now Joseph could no longer bear all those standing beside him. Vaikra hotsiu kol ish me'alai. Joseph says, get everyone out of my way. Everyone should leave me. He wanted to be alone with his brothers. Velo amad ishi tobid vada Yosef elechav. And Joseph was alone. There was no one else there when he made himself known to his brothers. 
Now, again, he did this because he did not want to embarrass them publicly. We're going to soon, the Zashim Shon is going to give us a detailed calculation of what Joseph did and how he did and what he said. But he wanted to make sure to not do it publicly, as we will see later on <laughs> is part of the retribution and the teshuva, the repentance that Joseph actually had to make. But now look at the next verse, chapter 45, verse 2. Vaitenet kolo Joseph had a very loud scream and cry. Vaishma Mitzrayim, and the Egyptians even heard this, Vaishma Bet Paro, it was so loud that even in the house of Paro, Joseph's cry, his screech was heard. Last verse I want to share with you, and this is chapter 45, verse 3, continuing. Vayomer Yosef Elechav, finally, Joseph tells his brothers, Ani Yosef, number one, first statement is, I am Joseph. Second, Haod Avi Chai, is my father still alive? So these are the two things he says is, Ani Yosef, I'm Joseph, is my father still alive? Now, the Torah tells us the brothers kind of choked up. They couldn't give an answer. And the brothers could not give him an answer because they were startled by his presence. Never in a, in, a, in a million years could they have ever imagined that this was Joseph that they were speaking to. Now, the Zashim Shan quotes a Midrash. This Midrash is quite, quite interesting. It's, it's actually quite scary. The Midrash quotes a, a, an interesting rabbi, not normally quote. His name is Abba Kohen Bardila. Anyways, this great rabbi, Midrashic rabbi, says, Woe to... Well, sorry, let me, let me take a step back. He first says, Anytime he would come and learn this verse he would actually cry. This verse of the fact that Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and then his brothers are not able to say anything, they choke up because they're flustered. This rabbi, Rabbi Abba Kohen Bardila, would actually start weeping. And he would continue to say, woe to us from the day of our judgment. Woe, we are in very, very big trouble. And he says, look at this story of Joseph. Joseph, which was the youngest of his brothers, is rebuking his older brothers, his seniors. Yet they had nothing to say. They had no response. How is it going to be at the end of our lives when we're going to have to approach God? and God's going to rebuke us for our misdeeds, how will we be able to answer? You understand, if a younger one, a junior, is rebuking their seniors, so to say, his elders, and the elders can't answer, what about us here when Hashem is going to be rebuking us, God forbid, coming from a superior stature, rebuking us regular people? How and all the more so are we going to have absolutely nothing to answer? And for this reason... He would cry every time, every, every, every time, and at least once a year when he would read this verse, he would cry at the fact that the brothers could not answer their little brother Joseph on their rebuke. So the Zashem Shon starts out by really trying to understand this episode and, and this Midrash by saying, what great lesson did this rabbi, does the Midrash learn from the story of Yosef? I mean, we all see it. We all understand it. But he's making a whole to-do. Do you know what it means to bring tears, to cry? I mean, there, there are a couple, but there are very few portions in the Torah, especially if it's not the first time you're learning it, that it's going to actually bring you to cry, unless there's some type of insight or something. But every single year, decade after decade, you just keep on reading this, and this is what brings them to cry? The Zechariah Shon says, it seems like there's something, but, but what is it that is triggering this rabbi to cry? Before answering, he asks, Four questions. Now you don't have to remember them because I'll 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 say them and when we answer them I'll 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 remind you of them. But these questions are really just dissecting this verse. His first question is, why did Joseph at this time decide to say Haod Avi Chai? Is my father still alive? Let's just play the sequence of events over here. So the brothers come back with Benjamin, and this is the second time they're entering. Um, they're entering the land of Egypt. Fine. They come back and they, at that moment, Joseph asks his brothers, 
well, is your father still well and alive? And they say, yes, he is. Okay, so he knows. He sends them off with their food and he brings them back. But they don't, they, they just get to the gates of the city. They don't get all the way back to their father. What could have possibly changed? Or rather, how could the brothers have even remotely known any change in status of Jacob? They never even got back to him. So the Zashim Shon says, it seems like it's a redundant and unnecessary question that Joseph is asking, is my father, sorry, is my father alive? He asked them, you want to call it a couple hours ago, a day ago? The exact same question and he already had the answer. Second question the Zashim Shon says is, as soon as they um, returned and, okay, sorry, he, he, he puts the two questions together. I said it as two. Number one is, why now does he say, is my father alive? And number two is, nothing really could have happened in the interim, okay? That's really the same question. Next question is asked him, Sean says, why is, why is Yosef saying, is my father alive? Shouldn't he say, is our father alive? It should have said Haod Avinu Chai, not Haod Avi Chai. That's a very famous question. And the last question that Zerashim Shon asks, to which we'll go on to to answer all this and, and and paint a beautiful, beautiful lesson from this, is what could the brothers have possibly answered that the Torah is saying that they held back from that they couldn't answer? Meaning, if someone is choked up and not able to answer, that means that they have something to say and that they really have an answer, but due to the abundance of emotions, maybe they're not able to. The Zerashim Shon wants to understand what is it the brothers could have said that they're not able to say. So the Zerashim Shon reminds us that Joseph knew, he recognized who his brothers were, but his brothers couldn't recognize him. Take a, pay, take a look at um, Genesis 42, verse 8. The Torah tells us that Vayaker Yosef et echav vehem lohi kiruhu. Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers couldn't recognize him. And why is that? Well, our commentaries tell us, Rashi reminds us, that Joseph at this time had a beard. When he left and he was 17 years old, he was not fully mature. He did not have a beard. Now he has a beard, and the brothers cannot recognize who he is. When he left them, they were all older than, they were, than, than him. They were all mature. They had beards. So he was able to recognize them, but they were not able to recognize him. Joseph was afraid, explains the Zerashim Shon, that the brothers would not believe him that he was Joseph. Can you imagine you, you are away from your family, from your brothers for 22 years. You finally see them and you reveal yourself to them and you are afraid they may not believe you. With this idea, the Zer Shimshon answers his first two questions. His first question of why is he asking right now? Why the timing? How, what could have changed? Is my father still alive? He asked them hours ago, not too long ago. So Zeshim Shon says, he's telling them, is my father still alive? Can't you recognize me? I look exactly like my father. The Midrash tells us, Zeshim Shon says, that the same way that Abraham and Isaac were identical, they literally looked alike, Yosef looked exactly like Yaakov. However, when he was 17, he didn't have a beard. So it wasn't as apparent. But today, when he's standing in front of his brothers, 22 years later, how could it be that he, they don't recognize him? They should have obviously recognized him. He looks exactly like his father. And you know what the Zeshim Shon says? Bring my dad. Because he will recognize me. If you can't recognize me because I look so much like him, to him, bring him, and he will recognize me. And shame on you that you don't recognize me. I look exactly like our father. But they didn't recognize him. And this is a very important lesson why they didn't. They didn't because in a million years, in their wildest dreams, they could have never imagined that this 
powerful, seemingly to them the most powerful man on the world, was their little brother that they sold as a slave decades ago. To them, he was a little pitcher. He was defiant. He was a nobody. How could he possibly climb the ranks? Sometimes in life, the answer is just right in front of us. But we're too small-minded, too narrow-minded to open up and say, wow, could that really be? And very often it can be. The brothers never imagined that their brother Joseph could be so successful to get to this point. And that's why they could have never, never identified him. He, right? It doesn't say that, that he wore a mask. I mean, honestly speaking, if you don't see somebody for a decade or two, let's say they don't change that much. Will a beard make the whole difference? I mean, I'm honest with you. Now with COVID, we wear masks out in the streets, right? Or in, indoors. So, I don't know. Some people have a better talent than others at recognizing people, but there are many people that that I may not recognize or they may not recognize me just because we have a mask on. But the Torah doesn't tell us that Joseph never put on a mask. He just had a beard. It's not a major, major difference. And the answer is, Joseph says, if you can't recognize me, bring daddy. He'll recognize me. And shame on you for not recognizing me because I look exactly like dad now. Okay, he may be a little grayer. And I have maybe a more brown beard, but it's the same thing. As soon as he told them who he was, then they recognized him. And then they believed him. And the Zerashim Shon says they were speechless. They were spellbound. They were in awe. They had something to say. What was it? The Zerashim Shon says they wanted to say you were right. We were wrong all along. That's what they wanted to say, but they couldn't. They were just taken so by surprise, the Zer Shimshon says. And because they were so embarrassed, they were never able to articulate this to Joseph. They didn't recognize him and they were so embarrassed about it. And they were so embarrassed about the way they treated him. All those years ago, the Zer Shimshon says, this is what Abba Kohen Baradila from the Midrash is telling us. This is what he saw from this story that was breathtaking, something that was life-changing. He says, the Zer Shimshon says, after one's life, when they are summoned to heaven and they're going to be judged in front of God, they'll be shown everything that they've done wrong. And a person goes through life thinking, maybe they aren't so wrong. Maybe they didn't do so many wrong things. And we find ways to rationalize our wrongdoings that we aren't that bad off. But after 120, it's gonna be so clear to us how off we were, unfortunately. And that will be an ultimate level of embarrassment that we won't even be able to answer for ourselves. And that's what went on with the brothers. And that's why the rabbi is telling us, woe to us for the day of our judgment. How will we be able to answer? Joseph's brothers couldn't even answer him. This is a very important lesson for us. And the Zer Shimshon is teaching us. The Midrash in Masechet Avot tells us who's a wise person? A person who sees what's coming. We all know what's going to be. We all know that after 120, Hashem is going to judge us. It's going to have, we're going to all going to have a final judgment. Why don't we from now prepare ourselves so that we won't be left speechless? Not to prepare ourselves with rationalizing in the most excuses. Yeah, we're sometimes very good at that. But no, why don't we start preparing for ourselves to not be left speechless, to not put ourselves in situations where we compromise our beliefs, our morals, our ethics, that we will be asked about them when we have our final judgment. And that will be, I guess, the clearest day, which to many will be a very hard day. And to those of us who really try, try hard, hopefully won't be so hard and we won't be left speechless.